Hello and uh, welcome back to the part two of this brief lecture on economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in this lecture, uh, which is originally prepared for the course Tax, Inequality and Sustainability, I will try to cover how we can counteract the consequences of the pandemic, uh, the consequences for economic activity, and then also try to cover the Norwegian government's response to this uh, pandemic. Uh, so, my name is Andreas Ockland. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate with the Centre Skatterforsk at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, previously, I've covered politics and the economy for Dag Lade and worked with macroeconomics in GMB markets. So, I will try to lean on this experience in this lecture. So, the goal is not to give a comprehensive and academic discussion of the macro macroeconomic implications, but rather to give an overview of the situation uh, the first phase now of the contracting stimulus and the implications for inequality and sustainability. So, what can be done to keep the economy floating? And I think just as important, should we really keep the economy float, afloat uh, in the time of a pandemic? Uh, this is a question a lot of people are uh, asking themselves. Uh, and the reason I ask this question is because the measures put in place now in Norway and in most of Western Norway and in the US uh, by now has shut down a large part of the customer facing service sector. And also other sectors like transport, tourism, etc. is equally hit by these travel regulations and the likes. And again, you have other firms again that sees their activity and productivity slow as employees have to work from home and care for the children and etc. So we have this large, large public program that's about slowing economic activity. Uh, the purpose of uh, purpose of the public policy is to slow economic activity. So when you're at the same time are going to do fiscal measures and try to stimulus, uh, stimulate the, uh, this part of the economy. Uh, the purpose is not to stimulate activity, but to secure a basic income for the employees and for the businesses and give the healthy businesses an opportunity to survive this downturn. Um, um, but still, uh, there's some, also something to be done to stimulate economic activity, keep the GDP going in a sense, because still uh, the larger part of the economy is still functioning. It will be affected in other ways, of course, uh, by the uh, by the measures uh, that affects the service sector, but it's still functioning. So take, for instance, the construction sector. Uh, the formal blockages are relatively few at the moment. Uh, outside of my home office now, there is uh, someone working on, uh, I don't know what it's called, but uh, there may be some noise and, and that's because there's f a few formal blockages at the moment. Uh, of course, there will be some negative labor supply effects from people being sick and being home and some supply chain effects from uh, businesses not getting the parts they need and uh, depending on other businesses. But the main worry for the construction sector by now is diminishing demand that um, the economic downturn now is uh, and uncertainty is leading people to postpone their investments in office buildings and in new homes and etc. And this effect can be counteracted by more public investments. For example, if uh, municipalities say, say that we need a new school and we should build it in two years, but we will build it now, for example, and give extra money to this. Um, and that's just one example of how the rest of the functioning economy uh, is set to see some weakening demand going forward. And as most of you know, um, when we have a demand shock, it's much easier to stimulate uh, the economy uh, without having inflationary pressure. So we now have a large part of the economy where, which we East, which we easily or easily, but 
that is possible to stimulate uh, without seeing inflationary pressure and without uh, colliding with the health precautions that we are supposed to take. Um, I should also mention that uh, the oil industry now is a special case because the oil industry is also hit by lower oil prices and lower glo global demand for oil. Uh, so in this case, uh, one may argue that the best contracting, contracting measure is not to stimulate further investments in the oil industry, but to allow investments in other industries that may employ former oil workers. So this is because uh, the lower oil prices uh, is not temporary or most likely, and from the markets, they don't seem to be temporary uh, like the shutdowns of the city around us now. So. Uh, so oil projects that were supposed to be um, supposed to be done uh, next year and the year after onwards uh, may now not be profitable, uh, which would lead to lower activity. And we have to find stimulate demand for these workers that now are having to find other uh, other sectors to work in. Mm. What also will be important is to strengthen balance sheets because uh, the financial crisis taught us how important the financial conditions and the balance sheets of households and of firms and of the financial institutions are for the economy and also for the econ economic recovery after the first shock. Uh, you need healthy balance sheets uh, for uh, businesses and households to be able to go out there and spend and to also to lend from the financial institutions. So measures now that put cash in the hands of households and cash in the hands of business will strengthen the balance sheets for the way forward and also make them more creditworthy and more um, uh, more likely to survive this period of cash flow free freeze. And this again will have a positive effect for the financial system to see their borrowers um, have being in a more more creditworthy and being in a healthier uh, state and also i think this the same goes for liquidity measures now that uh, policies that are trying to strengthen the liquidity of businesses and bis and liquidity of uh, fir uh, of uh, households uh, will also make it easier for firms and households to see their incoming cash flow now freeze in the short term but still be able to pay bills and interest payments because they see that what they are doing now will be profitable in the future. So that was what we should think about when we are evaluating this economics measures that's coming now. Um, so now I go for here. Okay, so what have the Norwegian Central Bank, uh, Norges Bank, uh, done by now? Uh, because uh, Friday last week, uh, Norges Bank, um, and what was a surprise decision for many, uh, kept the main interest rate from 1.5% to 1%. Um, because it was surprising because originally the meeting was scheduled for Thursday this week, but in extraordinary times, uh, you also have extraordinary measures. Uh, the bank also hinted about another rate cut this year, but no most observers are expecting rates to be cut even further down to zero and that um, even this spring. So uh, in the discussion about this rate cut, uh, we should know that uh, the rate cut will not necessarily stimulate firms' investments in the short term, which is what we are usually thinking about should be an effect of uh, easing monetary policy. Uh, this is due to the large uncertainty that's in our own business, as I talked about in the last lecture. Uh, but that does not mean that it will not have an effect. So it will have an effect on balance sheets and especially it will stimulate the households and their balance sheets and um, how they operate. So Norwegians have uh, huge housing wealth uh, through their homes and they are, of course, also looking at how much this home is worth today in calculating their wealth 
so when interest rates now fall, interest rates now fall, uh, you are also going to see uh, this propping out the housing market. And when you're propping up the housing market, you're also propping out the wealth of Norwegian consumers, and again, are more inclined to spend money. Uh, and connected to this large housing wealth, Norwegians also have large debt holdings. Uh, and the debt, total debt of Norwegian households amounts to two 2.5 times disposable income of uh, Norwegians. Uh, so this means that in insulation, uh, the rate cut will have a large effect. So when you're looking at this and assuming a full pass through to households, uh, the interest rate cut by now only amounts to a reduction in interest payments after tax of about 15 to 20 billion NOC, uh, so kronos uh, in total. And this is amounts to about 1% of disposable income. And that's a fairly large effect on how much money um, Norwegian now have in this, will in the year to come have uh, disposable. And of course, you also have this theory about uh, the intertemporal association of substitution that makes it uh, now will make um, households less inclined to, to save and more inclined to spend, um, of course. Yeah. So moving on to fis fiscal matters. Um, in the last seven days, the Norwegian government has presented several measures, uh, both targeting businesses and targeting households. Um, to make it easier for us to come uh, uh, succeed through this downturn. And yesterday, this, um, this package of measures gained a majority in Parliament and an, in an anonymous vote um, uh, after especially some adjustments over the weekend. So the most important fiscal matters right now is, of, of course, uh, to shore up the healthcare system and give enough money to deal with emergency situation. Uh, so more spending has been announced and also you have seen that tax and pension rules are now softened to um, include more students and more pensioners into the labor force um, and getting, so you know, like uh, medical students getting into hospitals and working. For businesses, uh, let's see. Uh, for businesses, uh, there's now been uh, introduced a uh, guarantee scheme. Uh, this will ensure liquidity for the smallest businesses and is guaranteeing new bank loans to small and medium businesses that are now suffering operating losses due to this situation with the outbreak of the coronavirus. Uh, so initially, this is a proposed that the scheme will uh, guarantee for 50 billion, but it's maybe more afterwards. Um, the government has also now restored the government bond fund that is supposed to buy bonds in the bond market where the largest companies now uh, are mainly borrowing their money. And this is also has a limit of 50 billion. And also to make it easier for businesses to cut costs, uh, the time the employers now are set to pay when uh, announcing redundancies, so laying off workers temporary, is now reduced from 15 days to two days. Uh, and this is supposed to make it easier for businesses that now has to close down or shut down and uh, can't employ people uh, to fa fast uh, cut costs and so they will survive through this downturn. But of course, uh, someone has, has to pay these workers. And what's been done now for workers is that uh, the government will now secure a full salary up to just under 600,000 uh, for the first 20 days after be being made redundant. So after being laid off temporarily. Um, after this 20 day redundancy period, the government will, will now introduce a scheme that will guarantee people an income of at least 80% of the income up to 300,000 um, 
in a yearly equivalent, and then uh, after 300,000, they will go back to what was the, like the the main framework before, which was 62.4% uh, of the income. So this will be between 300,000 and 600,000. They will have this 62% um, uh, um, rate. And then you have, yeah, and also you have this um, strength and compensation for uh, workers that now are out of work or have to stop working because they have to take care of the children. There's no taking out of the schools as are closed. Uh, and then a group that has been especially hit by this um, um, these special regulations in concerning the coronavirus is the self-employed and freelancers. So from now on, they are also they are set to receive sickness benefits, which they didn't before, um, after a couple of days, and they will also are set to receive after 17 days uh, a temporary income protection equivalent to 80% of what they have earned the last three years, in average, up to 600,000. Um, so this is a special measure that uh, they were not supposed to uh, expect, but because of this um, major shutdown of uh, the service sector businesses, where there are a lot of self-employed, um, the government is now uh, introducing this income security. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, we also have this uh, tax measures that's been introduced. And this was uh, mainly introduced uh, early last week and it was not that controversial. So the first is that companies with uh, deficits uh, that are companies that are now running into deficits can um, reverse the tax loss against uh, former surpluses. So, if you have a business that went uh, um, made a profit last year um, and paid uh, income taxes on this profit, profit they can now uh, deduct uh, the deficit from this already in this year, instead of waiting today to earning profits later again to deduct uh, the deficit. Uh, so this is supposed to make uh, ease liquidity. And you also have this other tax measure that regards the wealth tax where owners of companies that are reporting deficits this year can now defer uh, payments of wealth tax until the companies are going into uh, making profits again. Uh, so this last time this type of extension was put in place during the oil crisis, uh, very few people used it, uh, but you will anyway say that this may be a smart political move because a lot of the criticism about the wealth tax is that is it um, in the political debate is that uh, the wealth tax may uh, may introduce liquidity problems for healthy businesses this in the times when they are going through deficits um, so here you may have a smart strategic strategic move because it would be a political, uh, pol it would hurt the vi political viability of the tax if uh, if healthy businesses says it now would have to cut down because of the wealth tax. Um, and as an additional liquidity measure, the government is now also postponing the next payment, uh, the pa payment of the payroll tax that was uh, originally uh, thought about for May. And then, then you also have some uh, 
uh, fees for the um, airport business that are also cancelled. Uh, so, you know, um, the transport sector and especially the air, um, airline sector is now in a really big struggle. So this is kind of um, a way to circumvent uh, the state aid rules in some sense to just ensure that the, um, the travel companies are um, are going to survive. Okay. So, what can we expect expect of these measures? What can we expect uh, the effect of these measures to be? Um, these measures are these measures are really set to increase the what's called the structural non-oil deficit uh, of the Norwegian, Norwegian government. Uh, so the deficit uh, corrected for, so the deficit that we are taking from the oil fund and now into the economy is going to increase severely. And, uh, and that's only because of this first package of fiscal stimulus. And together with the interest rate cut, uh, these are expected to, if not fully, so at least partly counteract the negative effects of the uh, pandemic we are now seeing, uh, both on employment and on economic activity. But of course, you can't, you have a lot of hairdressers and um, different type of service workers around Norway now just waiting to get back to work, but uh, the government have decided that they can't work. So of course, there will be some un un unemployment in the short term. Um, yeah, but these measures, of course, is just the first phase package and more is expected to come. I think already this week, more uh, measures for the businesses are expected and in two months, in May, uh, the revised budget for this year will be presented. And here you will expect to see uh, some large public investments, uh, uh, public investments measures being taken, maybe some tax cuts. And of course, uh, especially because of the oil price fall, you will need fiscal stimulus also next year in 2021 and maybe in 2022. Uh, so this is only very early stage of this uh, counter cyclical uh, and counteracting measures. Okay, so to finish up, uh, okay, some technical problems there, but to finish up, uh, what does this all mean to tax inequality, sustainability, and all of this? So, um, well, I, I think it's important to hesitate that the main priority of the government right now is to ensure public health. Um, and the goal of these measures is to, to relieve the pain of the measures taken to ensure the public health. So they are not trying to contract fully, but they are relieving the pain. Uh, and until now, I also think there's been a fair share of costs between the state and employees and employers. Uh, but this may change and you should be looking after this. But so going forward, uh, I think it's important to remember that we can expect inequality measures, official inequality measures to show a decrease in inequality. So um, this is common in the downturn. As you saw it during the financial crisis that when the stock market crash and income among the highest earners fall, you also see that uh, the Gini index and inequality measures are also falling, showing lower inequality. Uh, but I think that this should not make us forget that during downturns like this, it's the poorest uh, in society that also is hit the hardest. So you know, we know that during public health crises, uh, that this is the poorest that hit the hardest. And we know that when there is mass in economic downturn you see people losing their jobs 
a massive unemployment. And also here that is that uh, although a lot of people will lose a lot of money in the stock market right now, it's the people that are losing their jobs and their ability to pay the rent and to live in the house they're living in that is falling the most behind uh, and that are most affected by this crisis. And I think that's um, that's an important that will be important for public policy also going forward that um, we can think that you will have a lot of people uh, capital owners and stuff uh, that will be working hard to see tax cuts for like uh, wealth taxes and etc uh, during this chaos but I think we should remember that uh, those that are the hardest hit are those that are at the bottom of the income distribution and, and those are also those that should be most um, we should worry the most about uh, when designing contrast acting measures going forward um, so on that note uh, I will finish this um, uh, this first uh, Jewel lecture on uh, the economics of uh, this pandemic that are making me sitting in the home office and are affecting other people a lot more, of course. Uh, I hope, hope you learned something uh, and we maybe do some quest uh, uh, our own lecture with questions afterwards. Um, don't hesitate to uh, uh, don't hesitate to contact me and I think it's this way. Yeah, up here you see uh, some addresses this uh, You can see my email address uh, So it's just uh, drop me an email if, if you're wondering about anything uh, And then you should also um, Visit scottafoss.no uh, So thank you very much uh, and goodbye